We will get started. My name is Stephen Smith. I am Executive Director of the USC Shoah Foundation, Shoah being the Hebrew name for the Holocaust. Um, in 1994, after filming Schindler's List, Steven Spielberg set out to give opportunity for survivors of the Holocaust around the world to tell their stories. Today we have 55,000 video interviews of survivors of the Holocaust and genocide from 62 countries in 42 languages. And those testimonies are available for you to see. What's very interesting is when you go to that archive and you type in the word art, you get two references. One of them is fine art. There are 991 references to fine art among those uh, interviewees who brought to their interviews or showed during their interviews fine art pieces that are either their family heritage or their own artwork. There are also 2,252 references to art during the Holocaust among those 55,000 people. What it tells us is that while they are telling their stories about their past, that the, the world of art continued through that experience and into their lives afterwards and is a relevant and living part of their lives. Today we have three amazing speakers who are going to take us into the world of art and the Holocaust. It's not the most obvious thing to think about when you think of the term Holocaust. But actually, these living, surviving, resilient human beings were doing what all of us do is as we lived through the Holocaust, we're creating, we're thinking, and we're um, being um, part of a living um, individual's life, just as we'd expect to happen. We're going to start, first of all, with Sandra Scheller, who's brought us together and convened us, and thank you for doing that, Sandy. Uh, Sandy's an award-winning um, author of Try to Remember, Never to Forget, and if you were here last year, you would have seen her with her now late mother uh, of blessed memory. Sandy. Thank you. Um, we have some people here. There's Don Harrison in the front from the San Diego Jewish World. And we also have Brett Davis from Talk with Brett. So we've got some wonderful people here that are very supportive to our um, Holocaust awareness. And um, I'm just so amazed to be here. Um, for those of you last year, we knew that the line was really crazy and very difficult. And so here's some information on my mother right there. And what I'm going to do is to play her eight minute section. You have to be kind of quiet to hear it, but this will allow you to pick up what my mother and I created when we were doing art during the Holocaust. And I hope you can hear it. I hope I'm plugged in to do it. So let's see what happens. My name is Ruth Sachs. I'm a Holocaust survivor, not from one or two, but from three camps, only to have returned to the first camp where I was liberated. I'm not sure if you ever met a Holocaust survivor, so here I am. <laughs> As I look around the room, I see that my life has gone from Holocaust hell to now come and come. <laughs> I am 90 years old, and I can tell you that at my age, I have reached new first by being here, and I truly love what I have seen so far. Mm. There is more creativity in this building right now, and this is freedom. Growing up, I was an only child, and very spoiled. I had a nanny too. I don't know if you see much difference from when I was one year old to now. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly don't see any difference, except I was pushed in a baby carriage, and now I am being pushed in a wheelchair. <laughs> By the time I was 10, I did hear the name Hitler and did see him from our balcony window, but only once. On March 14, 1939, our home was invaded and it happened on my mother's birthday. Nazis felt free to take what they wanted, including the family car. I was 11 years old and at the time, after the invasion, it was impossible to be sheltered by my parents 
and being a Jew was a day of that could not be escaped. I was marked by having to wear a Jewish star. They gave us and it was born until our liberation in 1945. In the camp itself, we had uniforms or remarked dresses, so we did not need it, the Jewish star. Had we not worn our star, we were subjected to beatings or even death. This is what I wore in the concentration, to the concentration camp. The photo was taken two days before I was transported and left in the camera. A relative who said she was not Jewish saved family photos and the camera. After liberation, I had the film developed and realized this was my outfit and yes, it was taken away. More details about my life. are in the book, Try to Remember and Never Forget, written by my daughter next year. <laughs> Do I remember comics and graphics drawings as a child? Yes. I do remember my mom asking my non-Jewish girlfriend to get a copy of the Stürmer, a magazine, a German magazine. Her mother brought this to us leaving the magazine at the door in hopes not to be seen visiting a Jewish people. We were shocked and surprised by the propaganda and the way of Jewish persons were portrayed. I remember being scared, wondering how could this be. Again, it was something we could not run away from, and being Jewish was a way of life. Also, I was very young and a child. Did I draw what I saw in the camps? No. But my art teacher, Otto Unger, did. Otto was a wonderful math teacher and a painting teacher and could draw what he saw to perfection. Chances are that if I drew what I saw and had been caught, this could have been the end of my life. My daughter will talk to you about it within a bit. As for art supplies, we had none. I was working in the camps, just in the children's garden, and then transferred to Auschwitz for a brief period. I did face Dr. Mengele six times. To make myself look older, I smeared red coffee wrappers to help me have the rosy glow. I looked older and healthier, and my mother did this to look younger. After Auschwitz, I was transferred to Öderan, where I worked in an ammunition factory. Just so you know, I took sand and street bullets so that they were not usable, and felt I could save lives from having bullets that would not work. Mm. Saboteur. <laughs> yeah. Here you can see pieces of metal from the bullet where I made a present for my mom and for me, a necklace. Also, I made things from bread and spit using whatever colors I could find on the floor and in the dirt. After the war, my art classes came in handy as I applied my knowledge to the drawing and designating, designing clothes and costumes. I had dreams of going to Paris and creating for the artwork, but thank God I met my husband of 63 years and came to America. I did not know about the superhumans such as Captain America and Superman and other comic characters they created during the war time. Maybe had I known about the Superman, I might have had a more hope and faith that I would be saved one day. Although my prayers were answered, 
he took a long nap the night before. I did even know about Kristallnacht until the war ended. As you know, we have no internet and the radio was our only source and then it was taken away of knowing anything. And entering the camps and then we heard nothing. I have two sayings. God created such a beautiful world, only some people make it so miserable. I am here today to remind you that another Holocaust will not be tolerated again. And by having you here today, you are showing an interest in Holocaust awareness and the art from the past. Of course, we can show all of the drawings and graphics, but we can get you to start it on your journey for seeking this knowledge. My next saying is what we shall rise above things as I have done. I'm living proof that hope is what pulled my family and me through one of the worst atrocities in the history of the world. Yes, my mother, my father, and I made it through the Holocaust, only to return our one out city, where we were the only surviving family unit. I will pass this mic to Igor, so we can continue seeing different images from what I was exposed to along with characters, comics, graphics that were popular during the war and my time in the Holocaust. You will learn of the superhumans that were created by Jews that were thrown out of Europe in the 30s. Hitler <laughs> did everything he could to control the intelligence by throwing out Jewish university students and professors. Some of these people were the most brilliant and most intelligent in the world, and thank God they found other countries that allowed them to continue their destiny. As I look at comics from the past, they tell so much with very few words. Some of the propaganda images are difficult to see at times, but I am here now and I'm free in a country and can say this is part of my past. You now can say that you met a Holocaust survivor and from three different camps. I just wanted to give you a taste of my mother, of what she was saying. She was 90 years old. She came here to Comic-Con last year and she was gonna get into the art. So what I'm gonna do is to show you the slides but I just wanted to give you a taste. Again, we didn't have it where we had our video people, so we drew the best we can, and we were gracious enough that somebody from last year's panel sent this to me. So I'm gonna show you what my mom talked about. She said that when she was a year old to be 90, the only difference was that she was pushed in a baby carriage compared to being pushed in a wheelchair. And in 1939, this is the star that she wore. Um, it, the invasion of the home happened on March 14, 1939, but I'm not going to go into the detail because we're here to talk about the art, and then we'll do all the, the commercials after the end of the program. This is what my mother wore in the concentration camp. Two days before she went in, a non-Jewish relative took a photo, and then everything was put into hiding, and five years later the film was developed. And when my mother got out of the camp and she remembered what was in that camera, uh, just so you know, the non-Jewish relative married my grandfather's brother. He survived the concentration camp, and a month later when he was on a bridge, it broke, he broke his back, and he died. One of the most important magazines that we talk about is Der Sturmer. And with Der Sturmer, my mother remembered that she wanted to see this propaganda magazine and what happened was that um, she went to a non-Jewish friend 
In fact, when my mother was told she couldn't talk to this non-Jewish friend anymore, she took off her gold necklace and gave it to the non-Jewish friend. The non-Jewish friend put this magazine under my grandmother's door and she was just horrified. And just so you know, my mother did survive the camp, obviously that's why I'm here, and the nice little girl, Zhenjina, uh, put the necklace back on my mom. So, kind of a happy ending. Um, my mother made bullets out of the, uh, she made bullets in Erdogan, but she also would pound them out and make these Jewish stars, and it says Erdogan, and this is going to be shown in my museum exhibit, I'll say our because I hate the word my or I, and this is going to be in Chula Vista in 2020. It's called Ruth, R-U-T-H, which stands for Remember Us, a Holocaust. So if you've got time, you'll come to the Chula Vista um, Public Library. I'm on the board of directors for the South Bay Historical, and you'll be seeing nine, if I'm not mistaken, 10, could be 11 survivors, just thought I'd point that out there, because two survivors said they would talk, they're twins and they've never spoken about it before. So this week, let's see if I get that interview. My mother, she wouldn't eat, but she took bread dough and spit, and she rolled these things. In fact, she even had a Buddha that she made. Why she made a Buddha, I don't know. I think she was looking for different religions. And uh, it's got a Torah, but if you look at this, it's a cook. And so out of bread dough and spit, um, she did this in one of our class presentations. They actually brought bread dough and spit and uh, taught the kids how to make dolls out of bread dough and spit. My mother's starving, but she made dolls out of bread dough and spit, so I do have these. My mother was an incredible artist. Art was so important. In fact, you're going to see art from something that uh, one of her teachers, I'll point it out to you in the presentation. And she needed to know because she wanted to be a costume designer. This was huge for her. So I got a whole book of her designs and they're amazing. I talked about my cousins last year. My cousins are Eva and Kitty Brunarova. The artwork is at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And uh, Kitty's artwork was found underneath her pillow. She was part of Freddie Hirsch, if anybody knows about Freddie Hirsch. She was part of the, the children that were gassed and then they found her artwork underneath her pillow. It's become a national treasure, so I don't have access to it. But in 1968, they made a 30-year commemorative, um, uh, what do you call it, postage stamp, and you could see Eva's uh, postage stamp, so Kitty's uh, postage stamp. So um, again, if you ever find one on eBay, call me, I'd love to buy one. <laughs> so here we get into something very interesting. Because, yeah, and a lot of times people can confuse were Nazis communists? I say no, okay? There was communists, and then you had Nazis, and then there were people who didn't know, but they loved the idea of joining something positive. So, yeah, means yes. And people were joining up and signing for things, and, um, you know, I have to be real careful because I've got the experts next to me, so. But anyway, this was my understanding from my mom, that people were just signing up for whatever. And here you can see that those that didn't understand communism accepted the views of Nazi as being courageous. And if you look at posters and propaganda, you look at that guy and you think, wow, he looks pretty cool. I can be like him. Isn't that neat? And now what we have here is a children's book, uh, anti-Semitic children's school book called The Poisonous Mushroom. And look at how we're portrayed. The nose, you know, look at us, we're Jewish, we're fun guy, right, I guess. So, um, yeah, I would love to get a copy of that too as well. But to be portrayed already, it's the propaganda. It was so, so bad. Look who is guilty of the war. Look who did this. He's the one, he started this. And again, this was in Der Sturmer magazine. My mother said that in, when she was being liberated, she saw a 16-year-old guy with a bayonet. She actually asked him, how old are you? I can't believe you're doing this. My mother loved to speak to people. And he's, I'm 16. And yet, the father's on the front line. The mother's probably in the office. So who's gonna be there for liberation, transportation? So the youth. So they tried to involve everybody. They drew what they saw. This is an artist, Leo Haas, if you look at, 
Look at the meticulousness with what they had. Hardly anything, whether it was charcoal. My grandmother made my mother look older by taking these red labels and soaking them and putting them on her face. And if somebody didn't look well, my grandmother was always boiling these um, um, different colors because she was a cook in the kitchen. Just so you know, every Friday when nobody was looking, my grandmother would announce that um, she had to clean the kitchen and she didn't want to expose the, the Nazis to the chemicals. And yet she and my mother and my cousin were there bathing in the warm soup and the water as my grandmother was cleaning it out. So my, my grandmother was just amazing when it came to that. Uh, this was my mother's art teacher in uh, Brno and in Prague. It was Otto Unger. Look how dark he paints this. Look how dark that is. And look what you can do with just charcoal. The inside of a concentration camp. I met somebody really amazing, Dina Babbitt. Dina's got such an incredible story. Um, she was standing in line. Dr. Mangala was going to gas her. Dr. Mangala was upset that he couldn't find somebody to do the right photography. And he goes, well, you know, somebody went to him and said, you put somebody in line that was supposed to be, you know, that's going to be gassed. And she was standing in line with her mother. And uh, she's an amazing artist. So Dr. Mangala had her pulled out of line. And, and, and Dina said, if you're, going to kill, if you're going to kill my mother, you're going to kill me, because my mother comes with me. And so whenever Dr. Mengele did an experiment, he, she was able to match the tones. And Dina went back to um, Auschwitz to pick up her artwork, and they said, no, it's a national treasure. And even the kids went back and said, we would like our artwork. That's ours. And they said, no, you traded your life for it. And, and that's kind of what we do today. Look at all the different people that are artists. If you pay for what you do, you sell it to a particular thing. So you can see these in Czesław, you can see this in uh, Poland, in Auschwitz. And if you have a chance, you might want to go online to see this even better. They're the Dina Babbitt comics, comics because she did a thing on the back wall in the children's um, um, barracks. You, she did a thing of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And somebody said that you could see Nazi guards crying when they were telling the story of Snow White and what had happened, and yet here they were killing Jews like we were nothing. And then here's more of Dina. I had a request for um, Charlotte Solomon. I actually had the request of Matt from Trina. You know Matt? We saw her yesterday. And uh, wonderful, wonderful woman. If you ever have a chance to meet up with Trina Robbins, she's great. And uh, you might want to go by her booth. And uh, Charlotte Solomon, very, very interesting. Um, she was murdered in Auschwitz. And Charlotte left behind a diary of nearly 800 drawings and paintings. By the way, Charlotte was four months pregnant. Charlotte was born in Berlin to a doctor and an opera singer. She was named after her aunt who drowned herself. Charlotte was told that her mother passed from the flu, but Charlotte's mother committed suicide. And um, she died at the age of 23, but she left behind something which was called life or theater. And it's a story that she wrote so she wouldn't lose her mind. She entrusted her work to a friend, and now we leave the legacy of um, Charlotte. So here's some of her drawings. Self-portrait. This is a great book if you can get your hands on it. Draw what you see. All done by people from concentration camps. And what I have now <clears throat> is from David Beck Brown. I have permission to show these because I would need permission for what I do. And uh, David is here. Go ahead and stand up for me, David. David and Sharon. There they are. Um, David acquired all these different uh, drawings, and I'm going to explain it in the next video if we're able to hear him. If not, um, what they are are very, very unique, one-of-a-kind drawings that have never been shown before except last year in Comic-Con, and I brought it today because I wanted you to see it, Stephen. Okay. So the story goes... The partisans killed 36 German policemen 
Hitler ordered for each dead policeman for 10 partisans to, to be killed. So they killed 336. They put them in a cave. Each one was shot in the back of, of the head. And uh, then they blew up the, the cave so that they couldn't be found. But in 1945, they found them. Here, I'm going to put this back. Uh, thank you, Sandy. That's, we're seeing there the power of art as memory, art as history, art as document, art as survival. Um, I was reminded when you were talking about Dina Babbitt that this woman um, was painting right in the heart of Auschwitz-Birkenau, several meters away from Dr. Mengele for several weeks. The young woman that you saw in the blue headscarf uh, was painted, she became Dina's friend, and then three weeks later she was gassed. Um, the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, people don't realize that there was a family camp in Auschwitz where families from Theresienstadt, from Theresien were brought. She painted the Snow White scene for the children in that uh, barracks to make their lives mm -hmm. a little more bearable. Um, and of course, all of them perished also. I'm going to hand over now to Esther Finder, who, uh, like Sandy, her parents were Holocaust survivors and has dedicated her life to telling the story of the Holocaust and um, was an interviewer for the USC Show Foundation for many years. And thank you for, your, for what you did for so many survivors, uh, Esther, and for all that you've done through generations of the show and working with uh, many uh, of your peers who are telling this story for our benefit. Esther. Does it stop? Can you hear me? Yes. My role today is to provide some historical context and talk about some of the artwork done by Jews in the United States during the Holocaust era. Most of the early creators of superheroes, the superhero comics, were Jews. But in the few minutes that I have, I'm going to talk about Nazi racial propaganda and how it might have played a role in the genesis of Superman. I'm also going to introduce Arthur Schick and Lily Renee Wilhelm, two Jews who escaped Europe during the war and were artistic pioneers who made their mark in the US. Let's begin with the Superman mythology. 1933, the year Adolf Hitler came to power, two Jewish kids in Cleveland created Superman. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster did not have to be very politically savvy to be aware of the events in Germany. Hitler, who was impressed by the American eugenics efforts to control human breeding, had been outspokenly anti-Semitic and German Jews who saw the handwriting on the wall began to flee that country, hundreds of them coming to Ohio. In this country, there were American Nazis who became increasingly vocal and threatening. <clears throat> Anti-Semitism was prevalent in many circles, not just among local Nazis. American Jews were discriminated against and painfully aware that in order to get ahead, they had to change their names and hide their ethnicity. There was fear and anxiety in Jewish communities around the world. Let's look more closely into the historical landscape into which the Superman story was born. <coughs> the Nazis promoted the ideology of social Darwinism, the survival of the fittest humans. In their narrative, the Germans were an Aryan people, a people of racial superiority. The Aryan German was the Ubermensch, or superior superman. Other peoples, like Jews, Africans, and Slavs, were inferior, subhuman, or untermensch. And you can see in this, the tall, blonde, Aryan Ubermensch towers over all others. The Aryan image was carefully designed to show the strength, purity, and wholesomeness of the German people in an attempt to get the average German to identify with this attractive image. Plus, as Uber mentioned, it was their destiny to be conquerors and dominate their world. Ultimately, Nazi leaders sought to replace Christianity with paganism. Christianity, like Judaism, says we should treat others like we want to be treated. That did not align with the Nazi agenda of trampling Untermenschen. The golden rule is not consistent with survival of the fittest. The Jew, Hitler's quintessential Untermensch, was demonized, vilified, and horrific images of Jews were used to terrify the German citizenry. 
This poster of the propaganda film The Eternal Jew is typical of anti-Semitic propaganda. <coughs> Jews were allegedly dark and sinister, ugly, evil, malicious, and dangerous. This cover picture on a German publication from 1935 featured the winner of the Most Beautiful Aryan Baby Contest. She's supposed to be the prototypical Aryan ideal. So nonsensical was Nazi racial theory that the baby in this photo is a Jewish child named Hesse Levinson. <laughs> in 1936, the Olympics were held in Berlin. Jewish Olympians in the US and Europe had been discouraged, if not outrightly banned, from participating. African-American Jesse Owens, by winning four gold medals, pinned a lie to the Aryan superiority propaganda. And it was noted that Hitler left the stadium without acknowledging Owens' victories. Contemporaneously, there were efforts underway to bring Jewish children out of Nazi-occupied areas to the US and England. The effort to bring unaccompanied children to England, the kinder transport, was much more successful than the attempt to bring kids to the US, where the idea was hotly debated and rejected. As the Jews under German rule saw their world being destroyed, there were very few children who could escape to a safe haven. England took in about 10,000 children under the age of 17. The US took in less than 1,000. Add to this the history and traditions of the Jewish people. Every year, Jews celebrate Passover, the story of the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt and their release from slavery and oppression. The book of Exodus tells the story of Moses, who was born during a very dangerous time, when male Jewish babies were to be destroyed. Moses survived because his mother placed him in a vessel and sent him down the Nile River. His life in peril, the infant Moses was set adrift in the hope that someone would find him and care for him. In the Superman mythology, kal -El was in peril, placed in a vessel, and sent to Earth where it was hoped that someone would find him and care for him. Even the name kal -El and his father Jor-El has Jewish significance. El is one of the Hebrew references to God. You may know this already if you've ever been to a synagogue called Beth El, that's House of God. If you know somebody named Michael, it's Michael, who is like God. Okay. Jewish tradition teaches us to do good for its own sake and to repair the world. This is what Superman ultimately tries to do. He does not seek fame or financial gain. Siegel and Schuster lived in that environment with that confluence of influences. It wasn't until 1938 that Superman was first published. Their vision of this character had evolved in the years since he was first conceived. Superman was a singular American hero during some very dark years. As the world was on the brink of being conquered by the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan, Superman represented strength, morality, justice, both legal and social, and the belief that everything would ultimately work out right. As we have come to know, Superman represents truth, justice, and the American way. One of the differences between the Superman of Nazi propaganda and America's Superman is that the goal of propaganda is to tell you what to think, feel, and do. With the comic books, you have the characters' thoughts, words, and deeds, so you have insight into their moral dilemmas. This can get you to feel and act, but it might also get you to think about the pros and cons of the decisions you make. The Aryan Superman was an egotistical, amoral brute and a bully. Survival of the fittest required trampling the weak without mercy. Nazi Germany wanted to rule, and wherever they conquered in Europe, civilians were vulnerable to mass murder. World War II was different from previous conflicts because combatants were not the only targets of attack. In their quest to rule the world, the Aryan Germans sought Lebensraum, room to live. The people who were there already had to go. The weak were to be destroyed so the strong could flourish. America's Superman was moral, altruistic. Yeah, we got, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> last year we didn't have a picture we could use. With the yeah, we couldn't credits. use a photo last year, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Sandy's my Superman model. Okay, America's Superman was moral, altruistic, kind, sensitive, and helpful. He was gentle but not weak, and as Clark Kent, he was underestimated. Superman easily could have conquered and destroyed, but his power was used for good. How many Americans were inspired to flights of fantasy by Superman, who was mild-mannered except when he's called upon to step up and fight evil? How many kids imagine that they, like Superman, might somehow be able to save the day? Let me share a personal insight from the perspective of a daughter of two Auschwitz survivors. Growing up, I fantasized that somehow I could be a heroic savior of my people and successfully fight the Nazis. As a child, Superman played with me, but I didn't know anything about this character. Propaganda was a very powerful tool during World War II. The Nazis used it successfully to promote their agenda and demonize their enemies. America used it too. No one created more important and widely circulated Holocaust art than Arthur Schick. You can find his work in the book, Arthur Schick, Soldier in Art. Sandy, you want to flip? Yeah. Born in 1894 in Poland, Schick came to the U.S. in 1940 and had a successful career as a political artist whose caricatures of Axis leaders made him popular in this country. And you can see in this one, Satan leads the ball. Oh, you went too far. Go Sorry. back. There we go. Sorry. Hitler's kind of in the middle there. Uh, and in front of Hitler is his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels. Now let's go. Using art was an important propaganda tool in the U.S. Look at the skulls, uh, the, the skulls in Hitler's eyes in this picture. Let's go on to the next one. In addition to showing our enemies in a most unfavorable light, Schick also used, also helped Americans understand what they were fighting for. And if you look at this picture, these were the dangerous enemies that the Nazis had to kill. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Encouraging patriotism and American values was an important wartime goal, and here you see black, white, and Jew in common cause. Okay, Schick was not the only Jewish refugee from Europe making a difference as an artist. Lily Renee Wilhelm, who is now 98 years old, was one of the first women in the comic book industry. Lily Renee was a Holocaust survivor who got out of Nazi-occupied Vienna as a kinder transport child. After a very unpleasant time in England, she managed to come to the U.S. and rejoin her parents in the early 1940s. Up until 1941, only men worked in the comics, and heroes were all masculine. Women were relegated to playing the damsel in distress. At that the hero, of course, needed to save. In 1941, men went off to war and women had to fill in their jobs. Lily Renee started working as a penciler and inker with comic books during the war years and drew one of the first female heroines. Her work with the character Senorita Rio, the first Latina heroine in American comics, gave her the opportunity to do what she could not do in real life. Senorita Rio was a Brazilian nightclub entertainer who was also a spy fighting the Nazis. She was glamorous, wore nice clothes, and was powerful. Through her art, Lily Renee could also fight back against the Nazis. Girls could identify with a strong, smart woman, and boys could begin to realize that women do not have to be damsels in distress. To conclude, Superman was created and published shortly before the outbreak of World War II. Both Schick and Wilhelm came to the U.S. during the war years, used their talents to raise morale in the fight against Nazi Germany, and left their mark as pioneers in art. Today I gave you a very brief sampling of art created during the Holocaust. The legacy of the Holocaust includes the impact this watershed event in human history has had on our comics and American culture. Thank you. So um, I try not to be genocide dad. So a few years ago I said to my kids, just to get my credentials, uh, let's go to Comic Con for the first time. 
So they took me seriously. Great, we have a day without the Holocaust in our lives. <laughs> so we walked in to the exhibition hall. They went to the bathroom, and while they were in the bathroom, I just looked at the first bookstore in front of me. And there was a little swastika on this comic book. And, okay, that's interesting. That's my kind of thing. And I found a book called comic, a graphic novel called Letting It Go by a Holocaust survivor by the name of Miriam Caton. Miriam worked for Walt Disney, Nickelodeon, and was one of the artists on Beavis and Butthead. When she retired in 2000, she turned her uh, art to her own story. And I'm going to segue now to Matt, who um, is chairman of Comic Fest. And, you know, these stories continue. Uh, we've looked at what happened during the Second World War, but there's this continuation of this story in our lives, which Miriam has so eloquently told. And, uh, Matt's going to be talking to us a little bit about his work. Okay, uh, cool. Work. Um, so a real brief about me. I'm chairman of the San Diego Comic Fest, another convention around here. I spent three years working for an online publication called World War Wings, talking about World War II history. And so now I get to talk about World War II history and comics, so my two favorite things. So, without further ado, I want to show you what I consider to be the most important piece of propaganda introduced during the world, world and World II, ah, during World War II. Captain America number one. This came at a time when America was still amid an isolationist policy where they did not want to get directly involved in a war, let alone one in Europe. But there were a couple of guys who knew about Hitler or well, what Hitler was doing and the oppression that Jews were facing. And you know those two men in here? Who knows uh, who decided to come up with this, these characters? Stanley and Jack Kirby. Got half an answer. <coughs> Simon and Joe Simon. Joe Simon and Jack Kirby were the ones who came up with Captain America and came up with the idea to knock out Hitler. I love this image. It's a wonderful image. I've adored it since I was a little kid. I have great appreciation for it now. Although the World War II historian in me just says, why is Hitler wearing beige in this wartime? He wore, he wore green in, in wartime. <laughs> but for the purpose of this lecture, I'm going to talk about Jack Kirby. I do not deny the contributions that Joe Simon had in creating Captain America, but I want to talk about the man behind Captain America, Jack Kirby. Here he is, Jack Kirby, the king of comics in his time. This was a guy who could knock out a 22-page comic per week. He was full of limitless creative energy, and he was Jewish. His birth name was Jakob Kurtzberg. He was never ashamed of his Jewish heritage, but he wanted his name to kind of sound tough, like Jimmy Cagney. So he shortened it for, as a pen name, to Jack Kirby. And of course, he did not like what Hitler was doing to the Jews over in Europe. So at a time when America would not stand up for the Jewish oppression or go to war, he stood up for them, and that created Captain America. So Captain America, as you might know, it came out prior to America's involvement in World War II, and uh, it caused a lot of controversy upon its debut. Because of that first image where Hitler is in there, and of course Jack actually, and Jack and Joe did not feature Hitler in Captain America number one. They thought, hopefully some guy will kill this guy before he goes in, so that we don't have to depict him as the villain. So that's where you get the red skull is coming out from there. But, this came in a time when there actually was Nazi sympathy in the United States. Madison Square Garden would fill up with 20,000 people at rallies at the American Nazi Party. And uh, they didn't like what Jack was doing. As you can see here, Hitler in issue two is wearing green, the proper color, so they got the color. <laughs> but there were a couple incidents where members of the American, American Nazi Party would go to Timely Comics, which was the precursor to Marvel, they would get on the phone, call up Jack's office, and say, hey, there's three of us down here. Uh, we want to show you what a real Nazi would do. Jack, true to his words, would go downstairs, roll up his sleeves, and get ready to throw down three guys, and they would go off running. Jack did not mess around. He stuck true to his ideals. And also, if we could go to the next slide. But notice the shield. You're going to point out. Oh, yes, the shield. Before I go on. Sorry. You might notice that there's a difference of Captain America's shield between issue one and issue two. So, in issue two, he has the legendary round shield that we know today. In issue one, because Captain America was actually starting to gain numbers that rivaled Superman in sales, 
Um, and LJ Comics, which was the precursor of the Archie Comics, they had a character called the Shield, who wore red, white, and blue, and sported a shield on his uniform, and they said, hey, 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 hey. you can't do that, or we're going to take legal action. So, not wanting to get into a snafu with their new hit character, they say, okay, fine, we'll change the shield. And then he started using it as a discus, so that ended up making the character much more successful, so he could just use it and do it as we know. Sandy is sporting a wonderful shield of, uh, that uh, represents that ideal right there. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, like I said, on the next slide. That's the next on. one. Oh, the next one? Yeah, that, that's it. When we talk about it, it had to be repeated Yeah. because so, nobody listened. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody listened. But Jack stood up. Ready? And then for this time, what did he do next? After America went to war, Jack went with him. Jack Kirby, in his uniform, he joined the United States Army. He went off for training in Georgia, where he finally got to meet people from different backgrounds in the United States. He finally got to hear a southern accent for the first time, and people were asking him, where are you from? Like, Brooklyn. It's like, what kind of accent is that? And so he said it was a great sense of unity in his time in the Army that everyone was joining together to finally unite against Germany and Imperial Japan and work together. So he started off there as an auto mechanic. And anyone who knew anything about Jack Kirby knows he was full of stories in his mind, and his mind wandered. So he wasn't exactly the best driver in the entire world. And so he got into a number of cars, and then so they recruited him instead as a rifleman. So Jack goes off to Germany. Well, he lands, he actually the battle of the Germans, he landed in D-Day two weeks after the Normandy invasion. And he got to work, and he started getting into shootouts with Germans left and right all day long. In fact, he nearly had to have his legs amputated because of the exposure out to the cold so often in those conditions, but he kept pushing, he kept pushing. Eventually, all this fighting began to take a toll on him, and he was serving in General Patton's unit, and he told them, fighting is not my thing. I want to help the war effort, but fighting is definitely not my thing. And they say to him, hey, are you that Jack Kirby? Which responds, yes, I'm the one who created Captain America. We have a new assignment for you. So it was there that they assigned Jack Kirby to be a scout. So Jack said, he figured they were trying to kill him, because if you wanted someone dead, they would make you a scout. <laughs> so because photographic equipment was not exactly readily available for development, Jack would go ahead of the lines to enemy positions, to unre unrecon towns, and start doing sketches and stuff. Say, sometimes it would be simple as just, uh, go over there, put X's on the thing where the tanks are. So Jack used his artistic ability to contribute to the United States Army. But one day, as Jack was scouting, he encountered something he never thought before. He encountered a concentration camp. It's up there. And his words are, there were mostly women and men. They looked like they hadn't eaten for I don't know how long. They were scrawny. Their clothes were all tattered and dirty. The Germans didn't get a shit about anything. They just left the place, just like leaving a dog behind a star. I was standing there for a long time, just thinking to myself, what do I do? Just thinking about it, just makes my stomach hurt. All I could think was, oh God. And those images would haunt him for the rest of his life. His wartime experiences, even into his later years, he'd be waking up in cold sweats into the night. His, raw, his wife, Roz, would have to calm him down. The war was a traumatic experience for Jack. But We just got a notice of 10, so we'll go through the next one so that we have room for questions and answers. All right, here we go. Sorry, now. But Jack was not alone in that. A cartoonist named Theodore Geisel also had taken issue with America's isolationist policy. So Dr. Seuss went to war and joined that effort, just making fun of America, not support, standing up for the Jews in, in Europe. So you have these wonderful sections here of Dr. Seuss got loose. And as the caption reads, and the wolf chewed up all the children and set up their bones, but those were four children and they didn't matter. <laughs> Dr. Seuss was not a fan of America's isolationist policy. He knew that America had the power to stand up for others, but just wasn't getting into it. So as we go on to the next slide, here's another character that was created by Stanley and Jack Kirby, Magneto. When he debuted in 1963 in the pages of the X-Men, he was just another run-of-the-mill villain, but 
not really so much. He was just trying to save human supremacy, whereas Charles Xavier preached for resistance. But when you get into the character into the early 1980s, when during the Chris Claremont years and the John Byrne years, they gave this character a backstory that justified his aggression. That's why humans didn't matter to him. It showed that he was a Holocaust survivor. That he says lines along the ways of, once my family was, was far and wide, but you'll find that I'm the only one now who bears my name amongst them. And the Marvel editorial for a time kind of skirted around the issue. It didn't really want the writers addressing the fact that Magneto was Jewish. But by the time of the year 2000, the X-Men had a movie. The opening scene, and I remember this, I was 14 years old, it was actually my first time seeing what a concentration camp even remotely looked like. And you saw this boy, dragged from his mother, pulling at her and pulling at her and seeing some bits of his power come out. At this point, there was no shying around the fact that Magneto was a Holocaust survivor. And I thought this to be a powerful origin for a story. But then in 2009, as we go ahead, there is a story that came out. It's called Magneto Testament by Greg Pop and Carmine DiGiocomero, which explores his origin. Max Eisenhardt, of course you might know it as the, he is a German Jew. You see him wearing a purple vest. You see him playing with metal all the time. He doesn't have a strong exact use of his powers, but they're there. And I can tell you, after several years in World War II history, like I said about the whole, oh, Hitler's wearing brown. There are things in World War II history that will really take me out of a story, so I try and, so I don't do it too much. But I will say, this story, this story here, when I read it 10 years ago, I thought it was the best story of 2009 that I read. And I read a lot of comics. And I came back, and I finally read it for the first time in, a, in 10 years, two weeks ago, and never once was I disconnected from the story. This story is a very, very real one. It kept me in the moment, and I said, this is research, this is real, this is history, this is horrifying. And you see that moment of Eric Lencher seeing the glasses and all the metal taken from it, golden teeth, metal plays a strong role in there. And so as we get into the next slide, the next thing I want to talk about are, you know, Disney during World War II. Fantasia, Walt Disney's masterpiece. I asked you, I mean, we've all seen it, but uh, does anyone know how Fantasia did when it first came out? Yeah. It bombed. You know why it bombed? Because Europe was bombed. Europe was bombed, and Walt Disney knew that his films had a tendency to do better in the European market than they did in the American <coughs> one. And so Walt Disney actually kind of invested more money than Walt Disney Studios actually had into Fantasia. And suddenly, due to the German occupation, he didn't have the revenue to fund his studios or pay his animators, and with the war raging, Walt Disney took one last chance. Went down the street to Lockheed and said, hey, so there's a war going on, do you need any help? And all of a sudden, Walt Disney Studios went from making roughly 3,000 meters of film per year to 300,000. Walt Disney Studios became a they became a propaganda outlet. They started doing training films. They started doing educational stuff. This is where you start seeing films like An Education for Death, going against anti-Nazi rhetoric and all that thing. So those 32 definitive films, but of course, my favorite one is The Fuhrer's Face. Go for it. All done. When the Fuhrer says we use the master race, we hide, we hide, like in the Fuhrer's face, not to love the Fiara is a great disgrace. So we hide, we hide, like in the Fuhrer's face. Are we not the Superman? Aryan we are Superman? Yeah, we is the Superman. Super duper Superman. Is this Nazi land so good? Could we leave it if we could? Yeah, this Nazi land is good. We would leave it if we could. We bring the world no order. Heil Hitler's world no order. Everyone of foreign race will love the pure space when we bring to the world disorder. Surprisingly, Walt Disney, of course, the band, I mean, he gets a rap for being, oh, he's just anti semitic No, no, he hated Hitler. He hated Hitler for like, nearly ruining his studio. But surprisingly, Hitler was a fan of Walt Disney. He actually had a private screening room for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. He actually felt it to be a strong German folk tale 
And like we said with uh, Lily Renee, it's, I mean, uh, uh, Dina Babbitt in her story, and also if you pick up Magneto Testament, it does feature the Dina Babbitt comic by Neil Adams in the supplemental material in the back. But yeah, that's pretty much as we go through the parameters of World War II, and of course, um, there are some other stories out there, like, uh, and I want to talk real quick, since we have a guy dressed as a mouse character, I don't want to deny Art Spiegelman's tale about his father, Vladik Spiegelman. It was great. He did a wonderful thing by doing that story. But if we're going to, we only have time for okay. questions today. Okay. He's talking about mouse, so here's mouse. Yep. But what's interesting is one of my favorite mice was Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Bible. And of course, you can thank Steven Spielberg for me. You can thank Steven Spielberg for that. But there's a reason why the mouse is collected across two volumes instead of one. When Art Spiegelman heard about Bible in 1985, he's like, I got to get this out now because there's a children's movie about Judaism and about Jewish, Jewish immigrants coming over. It'll get things out. So he published it right away rather than one tome. So that's why the mouse is in two books instead of one. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Dunford. Okay. Thank you. So the great thing about having such fabulous panelists who gave us amazing content is um, that we're going to uh, defer the question time to next year. <laughs> so please come back with all of your questions. Uh, for those of you who are interested in art in the Holocaust, on the 17th of September, University of Southern California, portrait artist David Kassan is launching Faces of Survival, his first um, exhibition on Holocaust survivors. I urge you, if you're in Los Angeles, go to USC, September, October, November, and see Faces of Survival. I want to thank Sandy. Thank I want to thank Esther. And I want to thank Matt. Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, if, I can talk, if you can keep your eyes open for art, uh, I'm sorry, it'll be Project Ruth, R-U-T-H, and we've interviewed nine to, to 11 survivors. It'll be at the Chula Vista Public Library for one year, starting uh, January 12th, 2020. And you can see the lives of why to, uh, these beautiful survivors came to beautiful Chula Vista, California. So I hope to see you there. Please follow our links. Um, go ahead and write down my um, Facebook page. Try to remember, never forget. There's Matt Dunford's. If I need to get messages out to people, I'm pretty good about doing it, I promise I'll, I won't let you down. Thank you so much, you're just all so beautiful. Thank you so much.